What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big dogs got to eat. Fantasy football. As always, it's your boy, Nicholas. We are entering week five, so of course I have to get my weekly video out <coughs> every Thursday. I'll be flying solo today, solo dolo. Adam Pfeiffer joined us last week. Again, if you didn't follow him, go follow him on Twitter. Link is in the description. So thank you, Adam. This week, we're getting back to our normally scheduled routine. We got key injuries, we got wide receiver cornerback matchups, which will always be taped tomorrow. Must sits, must starts, uh, some buy low, sell low, locks of the century, league recaps of mine. And that's really all I got for the intro. I just grabbed me a fat ass ham, egg, and cheese. I haven't had a brekkie sandwich in forever. You know what I'll show you? They call it brekkie. First of all, fun fact, I lived in Australia for six months. You know, I just got out of the gym, I'm feeling good. I got my, my dopamines high, my serotones high, my methamphetamines are running through my system right now. So I'm like, let's just get on the camera. Let's knock out week five. Let's eat some sandwiches. Oh man, there's nothing like a ham, egg, and cheese in New Jersey. Fuck what you heard about anywhere else. This shit is the bomb. Let's get cracking. All right, so let's kick it off with the key injuries, as we always do. Uh, I'm not going to get into the running back injuries because that, those were the biggest injuries to the fantasy football landscape this week, obviously. But each week I do the waiver wire sheet. It's a blog article I put on my, on my website and I send out an email blast to you guys who have subscribed to the newsletter as well as I post it on Twitter. So if you're not following me on or subscribe to my newsletter, just do this real quick. Go to my homepage, scroll down to the bottom of the homepage, just put your info in and every week on Tuesday, I'll send out my waiver wire sheet. And for the most part, the guys that you're picking up off the wire, they come from a result of injuries. So I'm not gonna get into Dalvin Cook and Chris Carson really, because I talk about them pretty in depth in that article. You can see here, you know, these are just like pieces of how I expect the backfields to play out. So we'll just kind of move on. If you have any specific questions about the running back landscape that's not addressed in my waiver wire sheet, you can leave a comment down below and I'll get to it eventually. Oh, and on top of the uh, my waiver wire sheet, I put out the murky running back situation sheet every Tuesday as well. I forgot to email that out yesterday. Uh, but instead of doing a video, which I did either last week or two weeks ago, breaking down every like muddy backfield and their snap percentage and like their total touches and fantasy points for the week, I put that out as a blog form, which I'll, I'll put up like here, you could see. And it's just breaking down each running backs like participation in the week prior. So that'll also be emailed, emailed out on Tuesday. So make sure you are subscribed. You can go check that out right now. It's up on the website for week five. So let's move into other injuries besides the big name ones that we know about. First off is Devonta Adams, right? He took that hit. It looked like his head was about to blast off. Turns out that the MRI was negative. No serious injury, no long-term results. He's in the concussion protocol. They said he has a chance of playing in week five, which is pretty surprising considering the hit he took. His, I thought when his mouthpiece popped out, I literally thought his face, his, his teeth popped out of his face. Not the case. In the concussion protocol, if Devonta Adams is out, Geronimo Allison is a very good spot start. He will, so we'll just kind of move on from there. If you have any specific questions about the running back landscape that's not addressed in my waiver wire sheet, you can leave a comment down below and I'll get to it eventually. So let's move into other injuries besides the big name ones that we know about. First off is Devonta Adams, right? He took that hit. It looked like his head was about to blast off. Turns out that the MRI was negative. No serious injury, no long-term results. He's in the concussion protocol. They said he has a chance of playing in week five, which is pretty surprising considering the hit he took. His, I thought when his mouthpiece popped out, I literally thought his face, his, his teeth popped out of his face. Not the case in the concussion protocol. If Devonta Adams is out, Geronimo Allison is a very good spot start. He was like the wide receiver three there when Cobb missed time two weeks ago. He caught six catches, 122 yards filling in. He was like a full-time starter. He played over, I think, 80 or 85% of the snaps for them. Uh, the game has an over-under of 52 points. So, you know, Rodgers is looking hot. He's got nine pa uh, passing touchdowns in the last three games. Adams, if he's clear to go, you want to start him. If he's not, you want to get drawn on my house in, in your lineup as like a wide receiver three or flex play. Moving on to another wide receiver, we have Corey Davis. He's already ruled out for week five. This has been a trend now. He's missed three straight games. They're ruling him out at the start of the week, like immediately, which is really, really not a good thing because it's not even like he's a game time decision yet. So at that point, when he's a game time decision, that means you know he's less than 100%. At this point, they're ruling him out 
the first thing, as soon as the week kicks off, ruled out, which means he's far, far, far from 100% health. This is the same hamstring kind of strain he's, deal, he's dealt with in the summer, which is just not a good thing to see for a rookie missing this amount of time. Bigger concern here is their quarterback, Marcus Mariota, also tweaked his hammy. He is truly questionable. He's day-to-day, -day, according to the coach. Malarkey, they signed Brandon Weed into a one-year deal, which means that they need someone behind Matt Cat. Matt Castle is the QB2 there. He'll be the starter if Marcus Mariota can't go. But it just means that Mariota is truly, truly 50-50 for this game. He'll be a game-time decision. Matt Castle's thrown six interceptions in his last five games where he's actually been the quarterback. Like, he's thrown at least five passes or more. So six picks in his last five games. It's a huge downgrade to this offense to the skill players, basically all around. What sucks is they get this nice stretch of games where they're going against Miami, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and you're like, yeah, Mariota's going to absolutely go bonkers. He's about to go off. Same with Corey Davis, same with Shard Matthews. And now, you know, we got we to gotta kind of pump the brakes. We see Decker and Rashard Matthews have both played in a ton of snaps for the team over the last two weeks. They both played in 84% of the snaps in both weeks. So they're, they're like the wide receiver one, the wide receiver two. They're the constant here in this offense, regardless of... Mariota is in. With Davis out, this is what we're going to get. A lot of Rashard Matthews, a lot of Eric Decker. If Mariota goes, I think Rashard Matthews is a clear-cut wide receiver too, like solidified for these next three weeks, right? Miami, Indianapolis, Cleveland, all of which are poor pass defenses. And Rashard Matthews has 33 targets on, or 32 targets on the year. Getting a ton of targets. Rashard Matthews should chee a lot of targets. Um, if he can't go, He's more a low-end wide receiver three flex because the scoring opportunities probably won't be there. He's a big piece of that goal line. I will say Delaney's a top, still borderline like top 10. You're starting Delaney Walker regardless of who's at quarterback. A guy like Matt Castle will probably rely on Delaney Walker. Uh, I'd also be okay starting DeMarco Murray here, even if Mariota misses it. You know, they're, they're going to lean on the run if Matt Castle is their quarterback. They're going to be handing the ball off to DeMarco and Derrick Henry. They still have that elite offensive line. So it hasn't been good. You know, DeMarco hasn't been great this year, but he should get like 15 to 18 carries if Mariota does sit. And I'd be okay with DeMarco as an RB2 for, for week five. We got uh, Odell Beckham. Really fucked up his finger. I don't know if anyone, you guys saw that retweet I did of his finger. It's like him catching the ball and his finger's like bent. Like, it's absurd. But he kind of tweaked his, his ankle messed up his finger. Uh, he should be good to go, though, for week five. He'll play through the pain. Part of the job description, when you sign up, Julio Jones messed up his hip a little bit, his hip flexor, a little hip strain, whatever it is. He should be back uh, following their bye. So they have a week five bye. He should be back for week six. So uh, not too much to worry there on top of like any kind of injury worry you already have of Julio. Taylor, I mean, uh, Muhammad Sanu is out for two to three weeks now with, with an injury as well. Again, they get the bye week, week five. Even if Muhammad Sanu is out, there's no one in that wide receiver uh, core in Atlanta that I want to be starting. Not Taylor Gabriel. I don't even think he had a catch last game. Matt Ryan has not been playing well. I do think it'll revert to the norm. He'll be back to his like career average numbers, you know, 250 passing yards, one to two touchdowns a game. But I, I like the idea of Austin Hooper getting more targets while Muhammad Sanu is out. Um, and then Julio being force fed targets. So it's no one else I really want on that offense, even if Sanu is out for a month or so. And just building on these receivers, we have out in Buffalo, Jordan Matthews gets thumb surgery. He's out at least a month. Now, the biggest boost for me in this offense goes immediately to Charles Clay, who I was already very high on and I was trying to grab him. And I did just grab him in, uh, I grabbed him in my E-Town Get Down League. I already have Travis Kelsey. But what I might do, with, with Jordan Matthews out, right? Tra uh, Charles Clay, I don't know why I was about to say him. Tra Travis, Travi Clay, Travi Clay. Is that like a Travi? That's like a rapper back in the day. Travi, whatever. Charles Clay, he's already a top four fantasy tight end right now. He's tight end number four. He leads the team in targets, receiving yards. He has two of their five receiving touchdowns. So he like is their offense right now outside of their run game, which is kind of non-existent at the moment. So I think Charles Clay is a legitimate top eight, top six weekly tight end in fantasy going forward, especially now with Jordan Matthews out. He's going to get so many. He's going to be force fed targets. He has the big playability as we saw last week. I think he went five for 121, catching a couple deep balls from Tyrod. They need someone there that could do that without Sammy Watkins. So uh, big boost to Charles Clay. I was thinking of I grabbed Charles Clay on the on the on the wire this week. I think I got him for like six bucks, which is a steal in my opinion. And I have Travis Clay. So what I'm thinking of because I have Demarco Murray, I have Chris Carson who just got hurt, who I had had in every fucking league. Chris Carson, man, 
You broke my heart. I still love you, but you didn't have to do me dirty like this. So Chris Carson is out, you know, and I'm kind of weak at running back right now. I do have Amir Abdul on the bench, Mike Gillisley, James White. So it's like guys that you're not so comfortable with because you don't know what you're getting on a week-to-week -week basis. I was thinking of actually moving Travis Kelsey for a high-end RB. Uh, maybe like a high-end RB2. I haven't really thought of any names in particular. Moving Travis Kelsey and then having Charles Clay in as my tight end, which I know it isn't like ideal, but it, I need to kind of round out my roster a little more. Anyways, uh, besides Charles Clay, Zay Jones, I think should get a boost because we've seen Jordan Matthews run like 65 to 70% of his routes from the slot so far this season. And a lot of that will probably go to Zay Jones now. Now, neither of them have been very productive. Neither of them have been good. They're not really using their wide receivers at all in this offense. But Zay Jones excelled in college as like a short pass catcher. He didn't excel on the outside. The slot is where he's probably most comfortable and where he'll do his best. So I think with Jordan Matthews out for next month, Zay Jones gets a boost as well. He's someone that you could roster in PPR leagues if you're in a deeper like 12, 14, 16 team leagues. Zay Jones is definitely uh, an a guy I want to keep my eye on. Now we move over to Oakland. Michael Crabtree with that bruised lung. Was out for week four. There's no word on his injury status yet. I guess he's week to week at this point. What's more concerning for both Crabtree and Amari Cooper is Derek Carr's injury. He's got a transvestite, tra whatever that word is, process fracture in his back. I literally wrote down transvestite on my thing. I thought it was a funny joke. It's not funny at all. I think it sounds a lot worse than it is in, in terms of like a fracture in his back, right? You're like paralyzation. Like I can't move. That's That ain't the case here. It's supposed to be two to six weeks. This is what Tony Romo dealt with last year when, when he let Dak Prescott in the door. Or for good, he closed the door on Tony Romo. And I believe, I, don't quote me on this, but I think I read somewhere that this is the same thing that Cam Newton was dealing with when he got in that car accident. Uh, a couple of years ago. Either way, you can come back from this definitely within the season. His initial prognosis was like, Two to six weeks, that's what he'll be missing. Uh, that third week he comes back, that week three of that two to six week window is a Thursday night game, so it is a short a short week, right? So if I had to guess, I would say he misses the first two, which is basically already guaranteed, and then since it's a short week, I'll say he misses three, and he gets back that week four, if, if he's healthy by then, best case scenario, week four, it's a tough road game at Buffalo, he still has his buy on the schedule, he has to play Denver again, he has to play the New York Giants pass defense, he has to play KC at Arrowhead, he hasn't even been good this season. His season high in passing yards is like 262 yards. So basically what I'm saying is Carr is definitely droppable at this point. Unless you're in like a 14 or a 16 or a 2 QB league and you don't want to drop him, I understand that. But he hasn't been good. His schedule sucks and we have no idea when he's going to get back from his injury, how good he's going to be when he gets back from his injury. This whole Raiders team is going to take, take a big drop in fantasy production or fantasy upside now with EJ Manuel as their quarterback because he's, he's the number two in Oakland. EJ Manuel hasn't thrown a touchdown pass since week seven of 2015. So until further notice, you're gonna have to downgrade a Crabtree and Amari Cooper to like wide receiver threes at most. Crabtree obviously is probably the better PPR play and he gets more looks in the red zone. That being said, like I'd be fine if Crabtree's back this week, you know, a bruised lung is not something you probably need to be like limited in game time, right? If you have like a groin injury or an ankle injury or something, that might limit your snaps. Someone like OBJ or, or we saw like Doug Baldwin both limited in their snaps, but like an upper body injury usually doesn't limit you. Uh, when you're coming back from the injury. You're either good to go or you're not in, in those kind of senses. So Crabtree, if he's in the lineup, I'd be okay starting him as my as like a wide receiver three. Speaking of Baldwin, clearly he was limited. He played less snaps than both Tyler Lockett and Paul Richardson in week four. They did get up big, so it was probably them resting him, but he played in 88% of the snaps in week one, 99% of the snaps in week two. So clearly they pulled the strings a little bit back on Baldwin. He should be near full health for... Uh, their week five game against the Los Angeles Rams. So I'm, I'm firing him up as a high-end wide receiver two, probably a wide receiver one there. So no problems with Baldwin here. A couple quarterbacks we want to get through. Hey, Andrew Luck will start throwing the ball again in practice. What do you say? Let's give him a round of applause, people. Imagine spending a fifth fucking round pick on Andrew Luck like a lot of people did this summer. Anyway, he's probably still two to three weeks away from actually playing. But, you know, if you have room on your roster, if you're in need of a QB, why not stash them? Sam Bradford has a chance to play in week five. They've been saying that for the last, like, six weeks. So we really don't know. The thing is, he's playing on Monday Night Football. So it's going to be a game time decision. So you're absolutely not picking him up in, in hopes that you're starting him on Monday night. You're going to need another plan. 
This is just a desperation kind of stash at this point if you're weak at quarterback. The quarterback situation right now with Case Keenum there seems to be a big downgrade to Kyle Rudolph. Which is, which is surprising because I thought someone like Case Keenum would have to kind of rely on Kyle Rudolph there as a tight end. You know, those over-the-middle kind of passes. Seems like Diggs and Thielen are pretty much okay to go as viable wide receiver threes and flex options. With Keenum, I was looking over the numbers. You know, in the three games with Keenum there, without Bradford, Diggs has averaged eight targets, five receptions a game, 99 receiving yards, and he scored two touchdowns in those three games. Thielen is averaging 7.3 targets, has five catches, exactly five catches in all three games, 67 yards, but hasn't scored a touchdown yet. So Thielen is a better option in his own right in a PPR league. Diggs can probably be started in, in standard or PPR leagues as like a low end wide receiver too. So he's putting up the numbers with or without Sam Bradford. So that's good to see as a Diggs owner. Who is wide receiver one right now in the year? Surprising to me, man. And lastly, a couple tight ends. Jordan Reed out in Washington. He played in just 26% of their snaps on Monday Night Football. He's clearly far from full health. Uh, you cannot trust him right now. They have a week five bye, so hopefully he'll be 75, 80% by the time they get back in week six. But to be honest, if you have an Evan, an Evan Ingram or a Charles Clay on the wire, I would be fine dropping Reed. If you need the production like now, you need a fill in for this week and you don't want to wait and you're, you're done dealing with Jordan Reed's bullshit, I ain't gonna be mad at you if you drop Jordan Reed. So. If you have room, I'd say stash him until week six and see how healthy he is. But if not, it's you know it, it happens, man. Things like this happen in fantasy football. You gotta, you got, you know, my man Gary Vaynerchuk always says he talks about being a good boss, being a good businessman when you're an owner. <laughs> if you're hiring employees, right? Everyone thinks they're good at hiring. When you get in the interview room, you see a guy and you're like, I know that's the guy for me. The key to being good at business, as is the key to being good as a fantasy owner, is not being good at hiring, drafting, picking guys up. It's knowing when to fire them. If you're two weeks into a job, the guy was amazing in the interviews. Two weeks in, he's a piece of shit. He's coming in late every day. He's getting his tasks done late. He's just not delivering. Same with fantasy players. Just because you picked him in the third, fourth, fifth round, he ain't produced for four weeks. If he's health, he's not healthy, he's banged up, you need pieces elsewhere, you gotta know when to cut ties. And this is one of those situations I'd be fine dropping Jordan Reed. Same with Jack Doyle, who's in the concussion protocol for this week. We got no concrete word on the boy yet, but it looks like he might be out for week six or week five. You're probably not playing him this week, so find another option if you were for some reason banking on Jack Doyle, which if that was the case, you're probably one and three or 0 and four right now. And that wraps up the injuries. I hope, I think, I'm not really sure. Actually, this kind of just came in, so I want to touch on it quickly. I know it's uh, similar to my running back situation or what I said before. Jamal Williams said he's good and believes he can play week five against the Cowboys. So people who <clears throat> went in on Aaron Jones, I'll say this, Tom Montgomery is dealing with these ribs and they say he probably 50-50 right now to play in week five. I'm gonna err on the side that he doesn't play I'll say, you know, it's 50-50, but if he does play, I, I see no way that he gets a full slate of carries. I also think Aaron Jones earned the number two role behind uh, Tymont instead of Jamal Williams. So I think at the end of the day, we're going to see Aaron Jones is the highest fantasy producer in this week five game against Dallas. What does that mean? I mean, the over-under is high, right? 52, 52 and a half points. If Tymont doesn't get a full slate of work, Aaron Jones is definitely the next best pass catcher in the backfield. Jamal Williams hasn't shown anything as a runner or as a passer. So Jones would be <clears throat> my next up. I do think he is the right handcuff, I guess you could say, to own the high time on. And we've seen, you know, Jamal Williams has clearly banged up his knee. Uh, time on's left like three out of four games so far. So I think at one point or another, you're going to have some value in Jones. I mean, you probably spent a lot more than you would have liked to hearing all this news about Jamal Williams probably coming back, time on coming back. But I do think Aaron Jones at one point or another will be the back to own in Green Bay down the line. All right, so we move on to some must starts for the week. My must start for the week at wide receiver is Devontae Parker, Miami Dolphins. I understand how bad this offense has looked so far, but he's put up numbers in three straight weeks now, in each week. He has at least eight targets in all three games, at least 69 yards, has a touchdown on the year. So he's been one of the consistent, <clears throat> probably the only consistent piece of this offense 
What I like more is that he goes against the Tennessee Titans. They are, them and the Patriots, it's not even, this is why I'm kind of scared about Deshaun Watson before everyone rides the hype train. He did it against the Patriots and the Titans, by far and away, and the Saints are like, what are you talking about? What are you doing? W-Y-D. These are the two worst pass defenses. Titans' pass defense dates back to last year as well. Like far into, like midway through last year, all the way up until now, they get murdered by wide receiver ones. You look at this year, they let up 17 fantasy points to Cooper, uh, 13 and a half to Michael Crabtree in week one, 20 to Alan Hearns, 14 to Marquise Lee in week two, 25 to Doug Baldwin, 11 to Paul Richardson, and then 26 to DeAndre Hopkins and 20 to Will Fuller last week. They have not had a wide receiver on a week-to-week -week basis. Their number, the, the worst wide receiver one finish we've seen so far against the Titans this year was Amari Cooper in week one, 16.7 fantasy points. And he should he dropped like two end zone targets, so he should have had even more. This is an awful, awful pass defense. I feel like even if Jay Cutler struggles again, Devontae Parker is gonna see eight to 10 targets. I'm sure he'll connect on a big play. He'll probably find the end zone. So Parker for me is a must start this week. I'm sure he'll be pretty chalky in, uh, in DFS as well. My second must start is the purple man out in Indianapolis. The running back, the ageless, the timeless, the gorgeous Frank Gord, Gore, not gorgeous, Gore. Frank Gore has not been good. Let me say that, he's not been effective. He's been useful, not effective this year for the Colts. He's been useful in fantasy for sure. Um, I believe he's running back 21 right now or 20 on the year. He's had double digit touches in all four games. He's had over, um, he's averaged over 18 touches over the last three games, that week one was the blowout by the Rams. They're, they're not going to use Frank Gore there. So he'd be pretty easily averaging 15 to 18 touches a game. Uh, had that blowout and that happened in week one. He's got two touchdowns on the year, so two out of four games. Uh, the 49ers, right? They got a home game against the 49ers. They've actually been surprisingly good against the run this year, uh, averaging just like 3.4 yards per carry allowed to running backs but they have allowed the fourth most fantasy points to running backs, uh, that position, this year. So the mix of volume and carries, as well as being the preferred receiving back here in Indianapolis, as long as Marlon Mack is out, you know, he got ruled out for the second straight game. There's a possibility he, miss, he misses week five, and if he does, then Frank Gore is definitely a must start. He's out caught Marlon, uh, Robert Turbin 44 to six in terms of receiving yards. He has more targets, more receptions. So he's clearly the preferred back there. When you look at this 49ers defense, they have, uh, the running backs have been targeted 36 times against this defense so far through four weeks. And they've allowed 26 catches. So that's over six catches uh, a game. That's six and a half, I think. If I did that right, six and a half catches a game to the running back position. Frank Gore, they're getting the touches. He's the preferred pass catching back. They're home favorites, and they actually have a somewhat respectable over-under in this game of 43 and a half. So they're expecting about three touchdowns, uh, maybe a little more from the Colts this week, Vegas is. So there's a good possibility that there's a scoring opportunity for Gore there, whether through the air or through the ground. Turbin is probably the preferred goal line back, but both of them have had a rush. Gore's had one rush inside the five. He scored a touchdown on it. Turbin has two rushes inside the five, scored one on those. So um, both of them are being used there. Gore is obviously the better play overall as a fantasy guy. So get Frank Gore in your lineup as a nice RB2 this week. All right, so this is not so much a must start as probably one of my favorite streamers for this week. And touching on this game is Brian Hoyer. Now, I'm not saying start Brian Hoyer over Deshaun Watson or even... I'd actually think about starting Brian Hoyer over Cam Newton, but hear me out, right? They're taking on the Indianapolis Colts who have been bad against the pass. They've allowed the fifth most fantasy points to quarterbacks on the year. Hoyer had a bad week four, but you look at his week three, he threw for 330 yards, two touchdowns. He had 34 fantasy points. Now you look at what Indy has led up over the last couple weeks, multiple touchdowns or 300 yard passes, passers to all four quarterbacks this year. That's Jared Goff, Carson Palmer, Deshaun Kaiser, Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson and Deshaun Kaiser have, have combined for 65 and a half fantasy points over the last two weeks against this defense. So I like Hoyer to kind of bounce back this this week against a weak Colts passing defense. He's one of he's one of my better streamers, he's one of the better streamers on the wire this week. So I would definitely think about starting Hoyer if you're in a pickle this week and you know you have someone like 
like I said, like Ham at Detroit, that's a very tough matchup because um, Detroit's been very surprisingly good this year. Maybe if you have someone like Phillip Rivers even. So Brian Hoyer, not a must start, but someone that I'm thinking about streaming this week, Bichelle. And I want to get a tight end to you guys. Who do I like this week at Toit on? I like Cameron Brait. He is a streamer. Now, he is getting less snaps than O.J. Howard has been getting, but he's easily the preferred passing catch. I think Howard has like 65% of the team snaps. Cameron Brait has 51, but I'm pretty sure Cameron Brait, um, I can actually fact check that for you guys right now. Cameron Brait, on his 50% of the snaps that he's playing in, he's only asked to run routes on... Or he's only asked to stay in and block on 5% of his routes. So he gets a really, 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 really good matchup against his New England pass defense that, as we all know, is straight ass cheeks. They have allowed the fourth most points to tight ends on the year. Breaks back-to-back -back games of touchdowns, at least four catches. Uh, killed the Giants last week. New England's allowed a touchdown and or 60 yards to four of the five tight ends this week. The over-under in this game is ridiculous. I think it's... 55 and a half right now. So we are expecting an absolute shootout in Tampa Bay. I actually expect Cameron Brait to find the end zone this week. So if you're digging deep at the tight end position, which a lot of people are this year, Brait is a very good streamer option. He's only owned in 65% of leagues. All right, so that's my must starts. Now, I, I don't know if I'm gonna get into a specific must sit kind of section here. But I want to run through a few games where I would totally be weary about playing these guys. First off, we have Cam Newton coming back from this terrible start to the season, right? And he rips off like 300 yards and whatever. He had a really big bounce back game last week against the New England Patriots, who have just been awful this year against the pass. And, you know, people are like, oh, he's back. He's ready to go. I don't think that's the case. Cam Newton's thrown five picks in four games a season. He has to go to Detroit, who has given up the fifth fewest fantasy points to the quarterback position. They've been great this year. Uh, the only quarterback who they've allowed to surpass 20 fantasy points is Matt Ryan in week three at 20 and a half. Otherwise, they've allowed 16, less than 16 to all three quarterbacks they face. Besides that, this defense is turning it on. And I think Cam is going to, while people think he's going to bounce back and they're ready to put him back in the lineups, I'm a little more nervous. They have good outside perimeter cornerbacks in Detroit. They have Ziggy Ansa just absolutely killing the defensive line rush for him. So before you get Newton back in the lineup, I'm, I'm, I'm pumping the brakes on them. This basically goes for anyone on the, on the Ravens this week. You can't start any of the wide receivers there. Can you start any of the running backs? Definitely not Terrence West. I think Terrence West is definitely droppable at this point. Uh, the Raiders are not a good defense. If I had to choose one, any sort of PPR would be Buck Allen. Standard, I would lean Alex Collins. Buck Allen just has that safe floor with receptions. He's He's been playing in like 50% or more of the snaps since he's taken over as that pass catching role. He's getting a lot of work. The game script has been there for him, which I don't really expect. It's probably going to be a very low scoring game in Oakland. The over-under is 40. Uh, Ravens are actually two point two and a half point dogs. So it's, it's going to be an ugly game, but they better not televise this game. I don't want a second of red zone to touch this game. You're also not starting anyone on the Raiders really outside of maybe Crabtree or Cooper as a wide receiver three or flex play with EJ Manuel as a quarterback there. It's just a huge downgrade to the offense. You're not playing Marshawn Lynch. He's one, he's very game script dependent this year. He's not seeing the touches that a lot of people thought he would. And he's just not doing it with the touches that he's getting, right? Six carries, two games ago, nine carries last week. Combined 30 yards on 15 carries. So if that offense is not moving and he's not getting goal line opportunities, you cannot throw Marshawn Lynch in your lineup. You probably want to get as many Packers and Cowboys into your lineup as you possibly can. Over-under is like 52 and a half. Another guy I am pumping the brakes on to Sean Watson. A lot of the same reason that I'm pumping the brakes on Cam Newton. It's the fact that Deshaun Watson, I mean, he's looked incredible, right? The last couple of weeks, especially from a fantasy perspective. But he did it against Tennessee and New England. They are so, 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 so bad in the passing game. On defense, that is. So he'll have a much tougher test against the Kansas City Chiefs defense, which is also not a great passing defense, but they're much, much better than um, the Patriots and the Tennessee Titans, who he's done it with the last two weeks. So I'm not ready to actually throw Watson in my lineup this week, to be honest, but in my 10-team leagues. Uh, that's not a problem for me in any of those. Um, I mean, my 14-team leagues, I would, but 
you know, I'm expecting one of those like 185 passing yards, a touchdown, an interception, and like 26 rushing yard games coming soon, which doesn't equate out to good fantasy points uh, for the most part for what you're expecting, what you've been getting from Deshaun Watson over the last couple weeks. So, so I pumped the brake on Watson at least for this week because we don't know what he's going to do against a real defense because we saw how bad he looked that first game and shouldn't judge him off of just one half we shouldn't even judge him off of one half of the season like we did on, on Jared Goff last year but I'm just saying there's definitely cause for people to relax on Watson before they go crazy and annoy him like a top five fantasy quarterback because the defenses he's playing are just not not so great I do think over the rest of the season he's going to be a good play because he gives you that rushing floor and he is chucking the ball deep. He's taking a lot of deep shots. He doesn't have to force it to DeAndre Hopkins because those deep shots pair very well with Will Fuller, who just came back, scored two touchdowns in his first game back. Kid runs like a 4-3-2 40-yard dash, which is, that aligns perfectly. Another group of wide receivers that I'm very skeptical about, the Arizona Cardinals receivers. They are like, if I can compare them to someone, they are basically the New England Patriots running backs of wide receivers, right? You never know what you're getting on a weekly basis. Each week in the waiver wire, it's a different guy. Like week one, you expected Fitz to go off. Same thing with week two, didn't do it in either of those. So JJ Nelson does it. You're like, oh, week three, it's gotta be his game. Then Larry Fitzgerald goes off. Then week four, you're like, oh, Fitz is back, back to money, right? Can't sit him. He did save the game with that touchdown at the end, but it was Jerron Brown who's the hot name now, right? He's the guy that you wanna pick up on the waiver wire. So to me, it's like a gamble. You're just kind of guessing who you think is going to um, produce on a week-to-week -week basis, and it's hard to play any of these guys, right? Let's see, week one, J.J. Nelson was the fantasy leader uh, of the wide receivers. Let's look at the weeks real quick. The fantasy leader in Arizona for wide receivers, week one was J.J. Nelson. Week two was J.J. Nelson again with a really big performance. Then he throws up a zero spot and Larry Fitzgerald goes absolutely off in week three. So you're like, okay, Fitz is back. Then Jerron Brown finishes with the highest point total on the team. So now you have John, uh, Jerron Brown, I mean, I'm sorry. Jerron Brown had the big game in week four. Now you have John Brown also back who is kind of fighting with JJ Nelson. So you don't feel comfortable playing Jerron Brown, John Brown, JJ Nelson. The consistent, I guess, would be Larry Fitzgerald here. <clears throat> And I'm not, I'm probably not sitting Larry Fitzgerald, but I'm just saying like every single week, you, it, there doesn't need to be a new hot name on the waiver wire from the Cardinals passing game because you never really know what you're going to get. I will say that the Eagles pass defense has been fucking terrible. Like they are, if you're in a, if you're in a slump, they're the, they're the fat girl that you get out of the slump with. The Eagles outside game is terrible since Ronald Darby has gone down. They have the pass rush, which could match up very well this week because the Cardinals have a terrible O-line. Palmer's getting sacked like eight times a game. They just lost Iupati and uh, I think someone else. I don't know. Their, their, their O-line is in shambles. Palmer's getting sacked, but they're throwing the ball a ton. So it's a weird matchup, I guess you could say. The Philly, what's the line? Six and a half points right now? I would take the Eagles six and giving six and a half points here. I think their pass rush is going to be too much for the Cardinals to handle but their outside game is terrible. So I would see Palmer connecting on a few of the deep passes, but you don't know who that's gonna be. Is it gonna be John Brown? Is it gonna be Nelson? Is it gonna be Jerron Brown? I would say the consistent there is Larry Fitzgerald. I'll probably talk about it more, or I probably already talked about it in my wide receiver cornerback kind of matchup sheet, but I'm staying away from anyone not named Larry Fitzgerald outside of my like wide receiver two, three flex kind of spot. All right, so we're gonna move into a section that I call what to do with dot, 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 dot. These are guys that maybe you drafted high, you invested some capital into them, you liked them, you were like, woo, I got them on my team, I'm happy about it, and four weeks into the season, you're like, shit. That's how fantasy works. What you have to do is be able to know when to let go, guys. You know, we're, we're entering week five, and by this point in the season, I usually say give it three weeks about to kind of figure out what kind of player you have. And uh, six weeks, you'll really know what kind of team and what kind of player you're dealing with. But now is the time where you can start making those conclusions. We're four games into the uh, the season. So here's a list of guys I have written down. I have Isaiah Crowell. In my opinion, you can absolutely drop him at this point. He's running back 48 right now. Duke Johnson is the running back to own in Cleveland. Last week, week four, Duke Johnson took 55% of the team snaps. Crowell only had 34% of the team snaps. So you're seeing what direction this backfield is going in. Crowell hasn't gone over 44 rushing yards in a single game yet. It's four games, 2.9 yards per carry. 
He only has five catches through four games, which paces out to 20 catches on the year. Last year, he was so valuable because he was also getting targets and catches, right? He had 40 catches last year. This year, he's only pacing out to 20. So that's where a big dip in the production is coming from, along with the terrible efficiency at running and the lack of volume. But you look also at like touchdown scoring opportunities. He's been outrushed inside the five yard line, inside the opponent's five yard line, by both Kaiser and Duke Johnson. Kaiser has three rushes inside the five. Duke Johnson has two, Crowell only has one. So basically he has no ceiling here and a really, really bad floor. So at this point I would cut ties with Crowell. If you, if you could sell him, go for it. If not, I have no problem cutting him. And same thing goes with Jameson Crowder. Wide receiver 91 in fantasy through four weeks. He has just 14 catches, 106 yards on the year. His yards per reception last year were 12.6. They've dipped a full five yards to 7.6. In week one this year, he had 14 yards in the game. This last week in week four, he had one target, one catch, negative seven yards. I don't even want to slightly think about taking a chance on that kind of production, putting him in my lineup. I'm not holding him for anything. I don't see the ceiling as being that high. He's had a couple okay PPR games so far. I think like 45 yards, 55 yards, but he's also had those dud games. So he's shown me nothing that says that anything is going to improve here for his outlook. Uh, I'm totally fine dropping Jameson Crowder. I already mentioned Derek Carr, perfectly okay cutting. He's going to be out at least two more weeks, probably more. Still has a lot of tough games on the schedule, and he wasn't doing that well in the first place. So fine cutting Derek Carr. The Washington backfield, Rob Kelly and Samaj P. Ryan. P. Ryan, you can cut the frick out of him. I want no part of P. Ryan. He's been awful when he's been called on. Rob Kelly is someone I'm definitely holding on to. He's having a very tough time staying healthy, obviously. He got hurt in week two. Then he left the game again in week four. But they get this bye in week five, and I think he should be back close to 100% by the time you know the team is playing in week six. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but Kelly's been actually running pretty well, if not getting a lot of volume, right? Before he left in week four, he had seven carries in the first quarter, which is great volume at, at that rate. He didn't, it was only 23 rushing yards, but the volume is good nonetheless. Then in week two, before he left with the injury, he was running well also. 12 carries, 78 yards. So for me, I mean, the ceiling is definitely low for Rob Kelly. Like, he's not an explosive player who's going to bust out 130 rushing yards in a game or anything like that. But I think he's safely secured just by how bad P. Ryan has been. Like, the early down work in this offense. They're scoring 23 points a game. They're averaging the eighth most yards per game. So it's not a bad offense by any means. I'm holding on to Rob Kelly for sure. At least until we see another game after the bye week. If you play shitty again, then you'll you'll reassess and maybe cut him if he's bad. Matt Ryan, Matty Ice, definitely holding. Uh, he's still six most passing yards in the NFL among quarterbacks. The touchdowns, I think, will eventually average out. Now, coming off their, their week five bye, which they have, I think they'll be well rested. I think they'll have a lot of time to prepare. Then they get Miami at home, then New England, and the Jets. So Miami, New England, terrible pass defenses. So I think Matt Ryan comes back, turn things around. It's been a slow start, but I I'm sure he'll be fine in the long run. And lastly, we have Terrence West, big time cut for me. Big, 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 big time. Get him off my team. He's not even the early down guy there in Baltimore anymore. Alex Collins has outrushed him each of the last two games, outsnapped him, and it just looked way better overall. So Terrence West not getting the early down work. Maybe he gets a goal line fucking carry every four weeks or something like that. Get Terrence West off your team. Let's move into the buy low candidates. I know this is a lot of a lot of your guys' favorite section of the videos. The buy low, sell high. I have a few buy low guys uh, that I can that I could hit on this week and just kind of going right off piggybacking off of those like what would you do with guys that's the Atlanta Falcons you have Matt Ryan and Julio Jones Julio Jones is banged up as per usual <laughs> someone tweeted uh Julio Jones got injured while getting put on the injury list thought it was kind of funny it was a little witty uh but again they have their week five bye I think he'll be close to 100% coming back he hasn't scored a touchdown yet so you know the explosion for Julio is coming soon like it always does. Mohamed Sanu is out for two to four weeks. And Sanu has 24 targets on the year. So he's averaging six targets a game. And that includes their week four game that he just left like early in the game where he already had three targets. So could have been a much bigger game for Sanu. Could have had a lot more targets. And I think a lot of those sanu list targets that Matt Ryan has thrown up will be siphoned to Julio Jones. So I think better days are ahead for Julio. I definitely think better days are ahead for Matt Ryan. Again, like I said, he's on pace for about 4,450 passing yards on the year, which is perfect QB1 numbers. Uh, he only has five passing touchdowns, and that's the problem. When you prorate that out to the year, that's 20 passing touchdowns on the year. But over the last seven years, Matt Ryan's only thrown under 28 touchdowns in a year. 
one time out of seven. So I expect when they come back and they have these easier passing matchups that Ryan gets things back together and he's a great buy low candidate because I think throughout the rest of the year he'll be a top 10, um, top 10 performer. And right now you could probably get him for quarters on the dollar. The next guy, and this is actually probably my favorite buy low guy on this list. It's Chris Hogan, New England Patriots. I'm not sure how, how good people or how much people realize like how good Hogan has been this year. I mean, the shitty part about putting him in the buy low is that the only people that know how good he's been this year is the owners, right? And they're probably not looking to really sell him that low, but he doesn't have that big household name yet, which is why I kind of think he's a, he's a buy low candidate. You can convince that owner like, hey, there's, there's more targets on the team. Uh, Amendola's coming back healthy. Rex Burkhead's coming back healthy. Sell me Chris Hogan on a low low. Here's what I think. Hogan right now is wide receiver three in fantasy in standard leagues. Overall, wide receiver three. He's wide receiver seven in half point PPR, wide receiver 10 in full PPR. He's had at least four catches, 60 receiving yards, and a touchdown in each of his last three games, and that's minimum. So he's had more than four catches, he's had more than 60 yards, and he's had a two touchdown game. So four touchdowns over the last three games. He has, he has four catches of 20 plus yards on the year, so he's being utilized as a deep threat as well. And you look at that week one game, right, where he busted, he had that terrible, terrible game. I think he had, I believe he had five, it was either four or five targets of 20 plus yards down the field. So he could be having a much, much, if, if him and Brady connected, and they were close on a few of them, if they connected on a couple of those deep balls, he could be sitting as wide receiver two or top five in PPR kind of leagues right now. Um, but in, the, in this offense, right, with Tom Brady under the helm and them just scoring so many damn points, all you can really ask for is opportunity. And when they're getting towards the end zone, Hogan is second in the NFL in red zone targets with eight. He is tied for third with uh, four targets inside the 10 yard line. Now he's pretty big too, right? He's six two, so he's like he could play outside. He could do the outside kind of wide receiver things that um, that an offense needs in that kind of player. He's also getting those goal line targets, like he's filling in for Julian Edelman, who always saw those looks in the red zone and inside the 10 yard line. So Hogan's able to do both things. He's uh, first amongst the New England wide receivers and targets. He's tied for first in receptions, and he's first in touchdowns with four. 14.3 yards per reception. Um, basically, he's good. He's just good, a good player, good wide receiver, a good fantasy wide receiver, and he's playing in around 95% of the team snaps. So this team throws a ball about 39 times a game. It's like there's no downside. His floor is so, is so good. On a week-to-week -week basis, maybe he won't have the big week. He won't be the one that goes off for 100 yards or scores a touchdown every week. But I think he's going to get six to eight targets minimum every single game. You could expect between 50 and 80 yards. And then maybe every other game, if not 60% of the time, he's going to score you a touchdown. So Hogan, not a household name yet. Someone you could definitely, definitely, probably buy low right now. I know I just said definitely, definitely, probably. Works 60% of the time. Probably half the time. Number three, buy low. T.Y. Hilton. This is a pretty obvious one. It's do nothing other than the fact that Andrew Luck should be returning within the next two to three weeks. Without Luck so far this season, T.Y. Hilton's on pace for 1,156 receiving yards and 68 catches. That's like wide receiver three numbers at the end of the year. If not, probably better than that, but he's not on pace for a lot of touchdowns. I think he's, I think he has one touchdown so far, so he's on pace for four touchdowns overall. But if you can get T.Y. Hilton for the second half of the season with Andrew Luck, he's someone that could help you win your league, win your playoffs because he is a legitimate wide receiver one when Luck is in the lineup. So if you could buy Luck or if you could buy Hilton on the low right now, he is someone that you should be targeting. Some sell high guys. I don't really have that many. You know, I've grown up. I've matured. I've learned from my mistakes. Todd Gurley is finally off my sell high list. I think he's someone you need to hold on to. I am excited. As sick as I am, I'm excited because I want to see Gurley fail on the low. I'm just kidding. I'm sure he's a great guy. Seattle. Actually, Jacksonville's a terrible run defense. Arizona hasn't been. Actually, a lot of the matchups that we assume, this is exactly what I'm saying, guys. Like six weeks into the season, we see who the teams really are. Seattle, Jacksonville, Arizona. None of them have actually been great ground defenses. Jacksonville's been by far the worst in the NFL. Um, so a lot of those matchups that were like, oh, wait till Gurley busts off and, and starts doing terrible. The, it may not be the case. So Todd Gurley, you're finally off my sell high list. Props to anyone who's high on Gurley. I apologize to anyone who I talk shit to about Gurley, which is probably a lot of people. Anyways, some sell high guys. Let's say I'm just going to go down the list of people who had a big game last week. Oh, Terrell Pryor is certainly one of those guys for me. Uh, four targets week two, four targets week three, five targets week four. Gets a buy in week five. He's someone that I am 
staying away from. He had that big catch, right? Reeled in a touchdown in their last game. So everyone saw him on prime time. They're like, oh, Terrell Pryor. This is the Terrell Pryor that, you know, that we're happy about and that we drafted. And now he's back to his wide receiver two status or whatever. I would get him off my team as soon as possible if someone was uh, looking to trade for him. I mean, you just look at the rest of the season. He has to play at Seattle, Minnesota, the Giants. His week, his two playoff matchups are Arizona and the Denver Broncos. So that is not good. He's not going to be able to really help you down the stretch. And he's shown nothing this year that is anything close to consistent. This this last game was easily his best game, and it was just a completely blown coverage on like a 45-yard touchdown pass. So Phil Pyre is someone I'm looking to absolutely get off my team if possible. And then, I mean, last week, who I said Tymont, I said Jay Ajayi. Both guys were my sell highs last week. Basically said like the day of, I was like Thursday morning, I was like, yeah, I'm scared of time on because I feel like they're rushing him too much. He's been super ineffective and he's going to get hurt because he keeps leaving with injury. It's exactly what happened. I would do this if you're still getting the same value in trades that you could for Ty Montgomery and Jay Ajayi, absolutely go for it. Ajayi, that Miami offense has looked terrible. They're talking about they're not going to use him on third downs to kind of keep him healthy and keep him safe. I mean, what are they keeping him healthy for? They're not going to be making the playoffs. They're a bad team. Um, so Tymon and JHI are both guys I'm definitely looking to move if possible. You could probably still get RB1 value out of Ajayi and probably Tymon too, especially if he's back this week. People who aren't like so intricate into fantasy football and people who aren't like so in tune with things will just see, oh, Ty Montgomery hurt his ribs. He's already back. Boom. Still, uh, still a running back one. So he's a guy that you could definitely probably still sell. And I guess we'll touch on some quarterbacks. I mean... Quarterbacks' trade values, especially in like 10 or 12 team leagues, are so low because there's so many good ones on the wire. But if you can get stuff for Deshaun Watson, if you can get stuff for Cam Newton, like I said, both of them have just had ridiculously easy matchups. Cam Newton couldn't even get it done against the Saints at home, um, but it goes to New England and gets it done. Deshaun Watson played really well at New England too, and then Tennessee was horrible. So I would trade either of those guys in a second if I could. And then really like any of the guys that had big weeks, Eli Manning, Phillip Rivers, just like realistically over the course of the season, they're all going to produce around the same, within 200 yards of each other and probably within like three or four touchdowns. So if you could package an Eli and someone else for like a, an upgrade at the wide receiver, like an Eli and a wide receiver for an upgrade at the wide receiver, the same thing with Phillip Rivers, it, there's no point not in doing it because the drop off from from one to the other is so um, so small. So I would say if you have two quarterbacks and you have one that kind of goes off one week, but they're an inconsistent quarterback overall, look to a team that might be struggling at the quarterback position, right? And then try to offload him to upgrade at a, a skill position. All right, I did this last week and I kind of liked this segment. I completely forgot about it, but I'm looking at games now, so I might as well run through it. My top storylines I'm looking forward to. I'm just going to run through some games and kind of see which ones I'm interested in. I'm interested in the Bengals-Bills for the fact that uh, Joe Mixon keeps getting these heavy, heavy workloads. He's not scoring, and Gio has far outproduced them in terms of efficiency. So I want to see if they keep feeding Mixon 20, 22 touches a game while Gio is clearly the more efficient back right now. I mean, it's probably better suited that a bigger guy like Mixon gets the carries, but I'm just intrigued to see how that goes, um, how that goes along. Lions at, or Panthers at Lions. Very intrigued to see this Lions team. Um, Cam Newton supposedly bounced back. He's ready to go. He's more healthy. I love how like everyone for four weeks is like, oh, Cam, <clears throat> Cam's not even close to healthy. He has like one game against a shitty offense. And they're like, oh, he's healthy now. He's healthy now. I'm like, y'all are the most mainstream whatever. Uh, but they play a legit Detroit defense right now this week. So uh, Lions three and one at home. I think they take care of business and handle the Panthers. And I think that storyline gets put to rest the one of Cam. And I think the Lions just solidify themselves as a legit contender going forward. I'm interested in the Giants Chargers, the battles of the, I was going to say the battle of the bastards, both 0-4. I want to see this Giants team, what they do on offense. Can Eli Manning kind of keep up this big play. What are they going to do in the backfield? Now that their uh, their rookie Wayne Gallman looked pretty good last week. Orleans Darkwall was out. Paul Perkins left with an injury. Vereen is their pass catcher. I want to see how that shakes out. I think we'll get a good idea against the Chargers, who have a bad run defense. We'll see who gets their first dub. I'm not really interested in ah. You know what? I'm interested in the Seahawks Rams game. Rams are three and one. They're actually favored in this game by a point and a half against the Seahawks. 47 and a half over under. So they're expecting a high scoring game and they're expecting the Rams to win. 
Can the Seahawks travel? Can they go on the road? They're only two away. Can they take care of Jared Goff and the Rams? This is probably one of the better tests that the Rams have had this season. And I think this will kind of help see whether or not they are legit. I mean, they beat the Colts, the Redskins, and the Niners. And I don't think either of those three teams are actually very good. They did beat Dallas at Dallas last week. So that's an interesting one. Um, Seahawks playing much better. Again, not great competition. They're two wins, but um, two wins nonetheless. I want to see how this matchup plays out. And I think we'll find out a lot more about both of these teams when this is said and done. And that also goes for the Chiefs and the Texans. Chiefs 4-0 playing at Houston. Houston's 2-2. Two two. I want to see is Deshaun Watson legit playing against uh, a real defense and the Chiefs. I want to see can the Chiefs play on the road against a good defense. Can Alex Smith get it done in a game where they'll probably have to utilize the ground a lot. And uh, I don't know. I'm just interested in seeing how that game turns out and seeing if Peters stays on DeAndre Hopkins. If that's the case, what does Watson do? Does he keep shoveling him targets or does he start using his other reads and check downs? That's all the interests I have in these week's games. I don't care about nothing else. Let's move to my, my league recaps, my fantasy league recaps. I will say, so I'm in four leagues. I'm in four leagues. Two of them are 10 teams. Two of them are 14 team leagues. I lost Chris Carson this week in every league. Again, that was devastating to me. So out of the four leagues, I am in four, I, I'm in seventh place in three of them, sixth place in one of them. But before you judge, hear him out. Now the E-Town get down, you know, my big league, you probably watched my live draft. Got that dub, I beat George's ass. So I'm two and two. I got scared because I, I, I went into Monday night. I was down 14 by Dustin Hopkins, Travis Kelsey. They handled business, they balled out. Um, but the team is uh, team's looking okay so far. I'm not scoring a ton of points, but I'll, I'm happy with two and two so far. I've lost Allen Robinson, Danny Woodhead, Chris Carson so far. I'm looking to make a move right now because we could trade draft picks, future draft picks, and um, but that you can only do that prior to the start of week five games. So that basically eliminates people like trading draft picks in week ten when they're already way out and they're like trading like a. You know, LaShawn McCoy for like a seventh round pick next year just, just to get the pick. So you have to do that before week four while or before week five while everyone's still in the league. So I'm actually in talks with the the Mike Evans owner who is like one and three, his team's in shambles. He just lost Dalvin Cook, Greg Olson, someone else. Um so I'm trying to make some moves on Mike Evans, which would be huge because then I'll have Odell, Mike Evans, Des Bryant. Uh, my running backs are a little hurt right now, but that would be big for my team. My subscriber league, I took an L. I ended up playing Jordan Reed over Vernon Davis, which burned me. I think I would have won if I played Vernon Davis, but how are you going to know? As long as Jordan Reed was active, I wasn't going to play Davis over him. I'm 2-2. Two and two. I should be 3-1 and one if I didn't. Uh, week 1, I lost by .3 points because by accident I left OBJ in my flex when he wasn't even fucking playing. So, I, again, like, the, the beginning of the leagues, like, the few first few weeks, like, if you're sitting at 6th or 7th place, like, you're fine. I'm not fretting it. Like, I, I should be 3-1, and one, so I should be fine. Uh, my college friends league. So listen to this shit. I'm one in three, but I have the most points scored in the entire league. And I also have the most points scored against me by about a hundred. So the thing about that is when, when you have like the most points or the second most points and you're, and you're sitting in like sixth, seventh, eighth place, one win will shoot you. Oop, sorry, we died. What was I saying? Yeah. When you have a ton of points, but you're sitting lower in the standings in the beginning of the year, that does not matter because one win, it will eventually even itself out. When you win a game, you'll shoot up the standings because you automatically own all the tiebreakers. So if you're in like seventh, you get a win, you'll be probably in like fourth place by the next week. So one in three, most points in my league, I'm okay with that. And then I have the Fantasy Jocks Office League, 14 people. I'm in six out of 14, which would put me in a playoff spot. I'm two and two, but again, I have the second most points in the league. So Another win would probably put me in the top four or three, so I'm not worried. At this point in the season, I'm not worried about it. And the last section of my videos is always for y'all gambling folks, the locks of the century. We're talking spreads, over-unders, prop bets. Who's going to take the money home? We're talking Vegas. Right now, I'm four and four on the season. I didn't do any last week because I did the uh, collab video with Adam of Roto Curve, so we didn't end up getting into the locks of the century because he ain't a gambler. But I have some good ones for week five. We got Buffalo at Cincinnati. The over-under is 38 and a half. I'm taking the over, 38 and a half, I think. Um, both the offenses are playing much better. I don't think since I don't think either defenses are very legit. The Buffalo pass defense is pretty good, but 38 and a half points is just not a lot of points. I think they I think they hit that pretty easily. 
Detroit versus Carolina. I'm taking Detroit minus three, so I'll give away the points. Give me the favorite. Um, again, I, I've talked about how I think this Detroit defense is legit. I think Cam Newton only bounced back because they played the Patriots. So uh, you can give me Detroit here, and I think they beat them by at least like five or six points, but I'll take three points even better. Green Bay at Dallas. Green Bay plus two. They're getting two points. So give me Green Bay here all day. Dallas just lost to the Rams at home. And uh, I don't think their team is very... It's just not dominant on offense like it was last year. This line is clearly taking a hit. The passing game has it, been fine, but I don't think either defense is, is great. And when you put Green Bay and Dallas in a shootout, I think the over-under is like 53 points. I see Aaron Rodgers winning that shootout over uh, over Dak Prescott because they're going to try to control the clock while Rodgers is going to kind of fly down the field and, and and score a bunch of points. So I like Green Bay getting two points there at Dallas. So those are my three locks of the century for the week. And that will conclude this video. So what I'll say is give it a thumbs up if you enjoy, please, so I can keep doing these every week. If you are not subscribed to the newsletter on my on my website, go do that, bdgeat.com. Scroll down, put your info in. You'll get an email every Tuesday when my waiver wire and running back murky sheet goes out uh, on Thursday when this video drops. And uh, and yeah, that's really it, I think. When you get, I'm not going to hit you with a bunch of spammy-ass emails. Also, go uh, follow me on Twitter if you are not because that gives you notifications for when I go live on Sunday morning. And hit the little bell underneath this video so you could... Uh, uh, get notifications when I go live on on the tuber. So that's that and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, sit starts, concerns, comments, if you're scared for whatever reason, I don't have nothing to do with fantasy football, let me know. I'm a I'm not probably going to be able to help at all. I don't even know why I said that, but and that's it and uh, good luck in week 5, y'all. I'll see y'all next week. I'll see y'all Sunday morning.